now turn to part one. Part one. You'll hear a student asking the officer of her school for information about accommodation for students, both on and off campus. First, you'll have some time to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, University of Leeds Student Accommodation Office. Good morning. I'm due to begin a course and would like to know what type of accommodation you have available. Okay, no problem. When does your course begin? The first week in October. Okay, I'll need to take down some details then. Can I have your name, please? Julie Drake. That's D R A K E. Okay, fine. And do you mind telling me how old you are? No, not at all. I'm thirty-five, but I'll be thirty-six by the time I begin my course. Thirty-five. So you were born in nineteen sixty-seven, am I right? Sixty-eight. Nineteen sixty-eight. June the sixteenth, in fact. Okay. Well, we have accommodation both on and off campus that belongs to the university. Also, there's homestay. Although most students prefer to rent a private house and live with other students, isn't renting a house expensive? Well, it is if you rent one on your own, but not if you share with two or three other students. Then it's cheaper than homestay, but on-campus accommodation is the cheapest. I see. So how much does it cost to live in student accommodation? Well, we have two kinds of accommodation. To live on campus costs one hundred and twenty-five pounds per month. But student accommodation off campus is forty pounds per week, plus three pounds per month for laundry bills. So the monthly fee is one hundred and sixty-three pounds per month. One hundred and sixty-three pounds per month. Okay. And how far is it from the university? Oh, it's very convenient. In fact, there's a free bus that runs every thirty minutes. It takes maybe ten minutes to get to the university. That sounds good. I'll go for a room off campus then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you'll have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now. Would you mind sharing an apartment with a male student, or do you prefer to be with other women? Well, I don't mind too much. Although, given the choice, I'd prefer a single-sex house. Okay, that's not a problem. I'll put you down to share with other women then. And what about smoking? Do you mind sharing with students who smoke? Well, I don't smoke, but to be honest, smoking doesn't bother me. I'm more concerned about noise. Anyway, that's all the information I need. But do you have any questions? Yes, I do. I have a couple of questions, in fact. What facilities are available in the flats? All the rooms are equipped with heating, but there is no TV, I'm afraid. Although internet access is provided in each room if you have your own computer, and all the houses have a communal kitchen with a fridge, cooker, and microwave oven. Hmm. No TV. That's a shame. Are there any restrictions? Don't like to put restrictions on mature students, but we do ask you to consider your neighbours. You know, don't play music loud at night. That sort of thing.
Just one more thing. Could you send me a bus timetable? Yes, of course. I'll just need to take down your home address then. Sure. It's Willow Crescent, London SE7. That's fine then. I'll send you the information and see you in October. Yeah, I'll see you then. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear a man giving a talk about grass roofs on rooftops of buildings. First, you'll have some time to look at questions eleven to thirteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to thirteen. And now it's straight into the eco hotspot for today's program. We are in fact going to look at an intriguing trend in recent years in the world of eco-friendly developments. There has been a constant stream of new green products coming into the market for the environmentally conscious. A new departure, which I feel needs greater attention drawn to it. Is the increasing interest in grass roofs? Environmentalists sing the praises of grass roofs as interest in sustainable ecological building has led to the greening of the rooftops of residential and commercial buildings around the world. And what does this type of roof consist of? Instead of tiles which allow water to run off and create flash flooding, the roof has a waterproof underlay which is laid over the roof deck. This waterproof layer is then covered with layers for insulation and drainage. Then, on top of the insulation and drainage layer, is added a final layer of soil or crushed stones for the plants and/or grass to grow on. The roof can be planted with wild flowers to add color and life to your rooftop. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you'll have some time to look at questions fourteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions fourteen to twenty. As for the benefits of grass roofs, in spring and in summer they are very pretty as flowers spring into bloom. Moreover, in summer grass roofs are of particular benefit in cities because they keep any building cool by reflecting the sun's rays. In winter, the grass roofs insulate the building, helping to prevent heat loss. The roofs require little maintenance and are better than any other roofing material. They encourage biodiversity by attracting bees and birds, and they absorb water runoff, which helps prevent flash flooding. In fact, the gravel layer retains seventy-one percent of rainwater that falls, thus helping to prevent flash flooding. In winter, the brown soil is a bit more evident, which can look unattractive if the roofs are not tended carefully. But that is a price worth paying, and I would say that they come highly recommended by those who have them. If you compare grass roofs with tiles, the latter do certainly look very tidy. 
but at a price to the future of the planet. The main drawbacks of tiles, though, are the water runoff and the absorption of heat from the sun's rays in summer. So, if we are to save the planet from the ecological point of view, tiles do not come recommended. The only roof that I can think of which has similar ecological credentials to the grass roof is the thatched roof. Thatched roofs are good insulators and very attractive, but very pricey and not ideal for cities. How can we make more of our roofs green? That is, how can people be persuaded to install grass roofs? The World Green Roof Conference in Australia was a very good start. At a grassroots level, the best way to raise the profile of grass roofs is to make them trendy by highlighting them in fashionable magazines so that people begin to feel that they cannot do without them. But the idea I like best is holding competitions for the best designed grass roofs. Next week, Eco Hotspot is going to look at. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You'll hear a tutor and two students discussing a self-evaluation form. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Now, Mark and Anna, I have to say that I thoroughly enjoyed your joint presentation on the application of robotics in a non-industrial setting to the group on 2nd of December, and it is clear that you have both devoted quite a lot of time and effort to it. Have you had a chance to fill in the self-evaluation form for the session? Yes, we have. So, Mark, what do you think overall? Well, generally, I felt the presentation worked very well. In fact, we seemed to hold the attention of the others throughout, and the pace of delivery was fairly even, as were the range of activities we organised. I agree with Mark, but I'm not sure we were comprehensive or academic enough. No comment, really, except that I don't think there was any question of it not being thorough. I think we were a bit too chatty and too jokey at times rather than formal. OK, what do you think were the best areas and which do you think can be improved on? Everything could have been improved on. I felt very good about the handouts. We had spent a lot of time putting them together. They had a very professional appearance as we bound them into a booklet. To me, the handouts were the best part as we had a very extensive bibliography and the booklet seemed to go down well. The booklet you did for the handout certainly showed you had done a lot of work, but I think that you put too much material into it and people got distracted by it. Perhaps you could have cut the handouts by about a third. I see. When I come to think about it, maybe you are right. OK. But there were times in the middle of the presentation where things did go a bit astray. I think that was my fault when I got the PowerPoint slides out of sequence and I had difficulty getting back on track. Hmm. I also think we rated our technical ability too highly, especially when operating under pressure. I had never done a presentation with technical equipment before, so it was a steep learning curve for me in particular. Yes, I think you could have done with a bit more practice with the equipment beforehand. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, You'll have some time to look at questions 27 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. What about the next item on the feedback form, the aims and objectives? I think they were very focused, and we followed them through well, I think. We wanted to show how Europe was lagging behind other areas of the world. Yeah, I think they were clearly set out. Yes, agreed. No comment there. The diagrams and charts were appropriate. Yes, I have put that too. They did work well in helping to illustrate and break up the presentation by cutting down on the number of words and text on the screen. What about delivery? Well, I think our performance was average. It was difficult to coordinate speaking and presenting the material at the same time. I was quite self-conscious of what I was doing. It was down to a lack of experience. Unfortunately, both of you had the habit of standing in front of the projector, so you kept blocking the image on the screen. To me, this is the area that requires the most improvement. The section on the predictions of the commercial application in the future, I think, appeared a bit haphazard. To me, it was a weak point of the presentation, and I think that some of the slides could have had fewer words. And we could have done some fancy graphics with the words. If you had to give yourselves a mark overall, how much would you give it out of ten? Six, maybe. I would be happy with that, though bits were probably nearer a seven. So I'd say a six. Anna, what do you think? I think for me it's perhaps a seven. OK, did you find the task and the evaluation useful? I think... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a talk on the subject of marketing. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Last week we looked at some general principles associated with marketing and today I'd like to look at some of those points in a little more detail. So what is marketing? Or, put another way, what does the term marketing mean? Many people think of it simply as the process of selling and advertising and this is hardly surprising when every day we are bombarded with television adverts, mail shots and telephone sales. But selling and advertising are only two functions of marketing. In fact, marketing, more than any other business function, deals with customers. So perhaps the simplest definition is this one. Marketing is the delivery of customer value and satisfaction at a profit. In other words, finding customers, keeping those customers happy, and making money out of the process. The most basic concept underlying marketing is the concept of human needs. These include basic physical needs for things like food, as well as warmth and safety. And marketers don't invent these needs. They're a basic part of our human makeup. So besides physical needs, there are also social needs. For instance, the need to belong and to be wanted. And in addition to social needs, we have the need for knowledge and self-expression, often referred to as individual needs. As societies evolve, members of that society start to see things, not so much in terms of what they need, but in terms of what they want, 
and when people have enough money, these wants become demands. Now, it's important for the managers in a company to understand what their customers want if they are going to create effective marketing strategies. So there are various ways of doing this. One way, at supermarkets for instance, is to interview customers while they're doing their shopping. They can be asked about their buying preferences and then the results of the survey can be analysed. This provides reliable feedback on which to base future marketing strategies. It's also quite normal for top executives from department stores to spend a day or two each month visiting stores and mixing freely with the public as if they were ordinary customers to get an idea of customer behaviour. Another way to get information from customers is to give them something. For instance, some fast food outlets give away vouchers in magazines or on the street that entitle customers to get part of their meal for nothing. As well as being a good way of attracting customers into the restaurants to spend their money, it also allows the managers to get a feel for where to advertise and which age groups to target. Another strategy employed at some well-known theme parks, such as Disneyland, is for top managers to spend at least one day in their career touring the park dressed as Mickey Mouse or some other cartoon character. This provides them with the perfect opportunity to survey the scene and watch the customers without being noticed. OK, well, we mentioned customer satisfaction at the beginning of this lecture, and I'd like to return briefly to that as it relates to what we've just been talking about. If the performance of a product falls short of the customer's expectations, the buyer is going to be dissatisfied. In other words, if the product you buy isn't as good as you'd expected, then the chances are you'll be unhappy about it. If, on the other hand, performance matches expectations and the product you buy is as good as you expected, then, generally speaking, the buyer is satisfied. But smart companies should aim one step higher. They should aim to delight customers by promising only what they can be sure of delivering and then delivering much more than they promised. So then, if, as sometimes happens, performance is better than expected, the buyer is delighted and is twice as likely to come back to the store. Now let's move on to look at the role of advertising. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. The IELTS speaking test is a part of the International English Language Testing System, IELTS, that assesses your English speaking abilities. The test is divided into three parts. Part 1, the examiner asks you questions about yourself and your general interests. Part 2, you are given a card with a picture and some questions to answer about it. Part 3, the examiner asks you more follow-up questions about the topic from Part 2. To get a good score on the IELTS speaking test, you need to be able to speak fluently and accurately use a wide range of vocabulary and grammar structures. Speak in a clear and organized way express your ideas effectively. Here are some tips for getting a good score on the IELTS speaking test.
Before the test, practice speaking English. The more you speak English, the better you will become at it. Try to find opportunities to practice speaking English with native speakers or other English learners. Familiarize yourself with the test format. Make sure you know what to expect on the test day. This will help you to feel more relaxed and confident. Prepare for common topics. There are some common topics that come up in the IELTS speaking test. You can find lists of these topics online. On the test day, relax, take a few deep breaths before the test starts to calm your nerves. Listen carefully, pay close attention to the examiner's questions. If you don't understand a question, ask the examiner to repeat it. Speak clearly, speak at a moderate pace and enunciate your words carefully. Use a variety